This is the face of Vanessa Brereton 15 years ago, seen here with anti-apartheid comrades and friends. But her life was a lie. Vanessa Brereton was in fact an undercover agent for the notorious Eastern Cape Security Police. She was reporting to this man, Colonel Carl Edwards. First he became her lover and then her handler. She says she agreed to become a spy for apartheid because she wanted to please him. Today we meet Lieutenant Brereton again in London where she now lives. She has now confessed to her past as Agent RS-452. Ashamed and guilty, she says her relationship with Colonel Edwards was central to her decision to become a spy. In the six years that she rose through the ranks as an agent, she reported on her colleagues and friends, betraying hundreds of activists who trusted her implicitly. All for the love of one man, her handler, she says. I'd met him in December 84 um, at a social occasion and we became lovers. He mentioned to me in about March that he was looking for a human rights lawyer who would be ha or who would have the ability to infiltrate the white left. I was attracted to him from that first meeting and um, I just blinded myself to, to his occupation and because I was I suppose I was in love with him and spellbound by him. I agreed to become an agent. Carl Edwards denies that he ever had a sexual relationship with you. Well, I, I guess he would say that now, um, but I can assure you we did have a relationship for six years. Um, we actually had a very close emotional connection which continued after I left the security branch in 1991 because he did used to come and visit me, although a relationship had ended, but he did used to come and see me to check that I was all right and, um, and so on. And I last saw him in April 1995. He says, I knew that Vanessa was in love with me, but there was never an intimate relationship. There was no time for a sexual relationship. My response to that is that I was in love with him and there most definitely was time for a sexual relationship. There were times when he was accompanied by a colleague during our debriefing sessions, but we did have other meetings, debriefing sessions, where we were alone and there was plenty of opportunity. Our f the first safe house where we, where we met was a, a flat in Humid. I had a key to the flat um, so I could come and go, and we used to meet there often. I mean, Carl Edwards was a powerful man. Mm. He had the power to detain people, he had the power to torture people. Um, what was it like being the lover of such a man? I suppose it was exciting and it was thrilling. As Mark Lowe said in his open letter to me, I must agree with him on that. It was very exciting. What was it about Carl Edwards that, that so mesmerized you? I mean, I say powers and aphrodisiac. Um, I'm afraid that was true in my case. If someone else, not Carl Edwards, had asked you to become a spy, would you have done it? No, I wouldn't have. I think I was, I was spellbound by Carl. I wanted to carry on my relationship with him and also being working in a professional capacity with him meant that I would continue to see more of him. So it, it, it suited me. You claim that you developed a strong fear and horror of communism at school and that these were feelings and beliefs that Edwards exploited. Um, Carl persuaded me that that South Africa was a threat from a communist onslaught and because I do have anti-communist beliefs he, he reinforced those ideas in my head and made me feel really special that I was doing important work for my country, being patriotic and so he constantly reinforced these ideas that I was doing something very, very important. What kind of money were you paid? Was money an issue? Money was never an issue for me. That wasn't the reason why I joined. Um, the money initially was very, was not very much. I was initially recruited as a, as a police informer, and then I joined, officially joined the security branch approximately a year later. 
You say you didn't do it for, for the money, you did it for the love of Carl Edwards and for the hatred you, you felt for communism. How much were you paid? It was a thousand rand plus a month. I can't remember the exact amount. Did the security police ever give you money for your practice? No, never. People seem to be taking pains to make out that I was a, a greedy person, only interested in money and in furthering my own materialistic aims. That simply isn't true. So appearances are not always what they seem. Appearances were certainly not what they seemed. While Brereton the spy was hiding behind her work as a human rights lawyer, resistance to apartheid was reaching boiling point in the Eastern Cape. A state of emergency was declared. Torture, detentions without trial and the disappearance of activists were commonplace. In May 1985, the Pepco 3 were abducted and killed by the police. And Matthew Goniwe and his three Craddock comrades were found murdered in their car. As the Eastern Cape burned, a district surgeon, Dr. Wendy Orr, made world headlines when she exposed widespread torture of detainees in the Eastern Cape. During all of this, Brereton's legal practice was booming as she took on more and more cases. Representing the interests of political detainees, the victims of police brutality and hundreds of youth facing criminal charges. In 1985, the Langer massacre shocked the world. The Truth Commission heard that up to 43 people died that day. Vanessa Brereton, the human rights lawyer, was at the scene to take statements. But it was also Vanessa Brereton, the spy's first day of work. There was that whole dichotomy arising again. I was, saw myself as a lawyer helping people and but also realizing that doing this work would ensure that I would gain access to the white left which was the whole purpose of my becoming involved there. You talk about this double life and about putting things in different compartments and being able to live between these two worlds. Mm -hmm. I struggle to understand it because you weren't doing a job where you weren't exposed to the absolute horror of the Eastern Cape in the 80s. Um, People were disappearing, people were being tortured. Um, how did you not know? It's something that I'm still struggling to come to terms with, um, that I just buried this knowledge and, and, and perhaps chose to ignore it. I suppose, basically, I put my own needs above those of, of other people. And I, I suppose it's a very selfish thing. I think that's basically that I, I chose to ignore the things that were not pleasant. But how did you deal with that when clients came to you? Um, people who have been detained, people who came to you with those stories, those horrible stories of, of police brutality. How, what did you do with that? And that's, that's the, see, that's now the, the whole um, the double existence. When they came to see me, I was a lawyer. I took their statements. Um, did whatever was necessary in the institution proceedings or defended them um, if they were charged with murder or something and they'd made a confession which they'd been um, tortured into making. And I did represent people who were charged, say, with murder, who were tortured into making confessions and I actually managed to get those people acquitted. So, as you can see, it is very bizarre. I just, I, I myself am struggling to come to terms with it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about about the security police in the Eastern Cape at that time. They were a particularly nasty bunch, as was revealed at the Truth Commission. What did you think had happened to, for instance, the Craddock Hall? I had my suspicions that it was the security police or the military, somebody from the, from the um, establishment, but I wasn't sure, um, but I felt very uneasy. Um, in fact, I felt so uneasy that I never actually directly asked Carl Edwards about the Craddock Fall because I think I was too, not that he would have told me anything, but I was actually probably scared of the answer that he would give me because then I would be placed in a dilemma that I 
couldn't knowingly carry on being smart.